away we go. Let's see what I've got here. Okay, so we are here today to learn about retrieval practice and spacing as two really solid learning techniques. We put a lot of information out to students right now. We're giving them videos, we're giving them links, we're giving them, um, and uh, you know, how do we know students are learning anything, right? So what we can do is we can look to the world of cognitive science. These are retrieval practice and spacing are two strategies that have been proved over a hundred years of cognitive science. Uh, and research to be 100% uh, effective. And so uh, what we're gonna do today is we're gonna talk a little bit first about what retrieval practice and spacing is, and then um, some strategies for using that, and then some technologies that we can, some actual technology we can use to sort of reinforce those two learning practices, okay? Uh, we know you're a great teacher. Uh, you do a great job of teaching, and we've seen teachers rise to the occasion and are teaching adapting to this remote learning world in awesome, awesome ways. Anybody see the video of the guy? Um, he was on Facebook. He was teaching chemistry in his bathroom. He, uh, he was using his shower as a whiteboard. It was pretty awesome because the whiteboard markers worked really well on that plastic shower. And uh, he had a five gallon pail sitting on his toilet and laptop propped up, pointed towards the shower. It was super cool. So, I mean, there's so many, so many different examples of teachers sharing and teaching. So teaching isn't the problem, it's, it's, it's making that learning durable and long lasting. And that's a challenge enough when students are in front of us and with us, uh, and when they're in remote uh, environments by themselves, how can we make sure that learning is happening? So I'll share with you some strategies. Uh, these are also gonna be really nice strategies that you can share with your parents. And so that is something uh, very exciting. So I'll share with you a couple of resources if you'd like to uh, do some follow-up learning. This is a website that I made that includes um, some information and research, not only about, uh, while well, this page loads up here, while well, not only about retrieval practice and spacing, but several other strategies proven through cognitive science. Um, including um, interleaving, uh, elaborative interrogation. There are several other of these techniques that have been really solidly proven. You can find a lot more information on this website. Um, I also am basing a lot of this information on, um, I'm getting a lot of it from two main websites, okay? One I wanna share with you is called retrievalpractice.org. It is awesome. If you wanna learn more about this and other strategies, there's lots and lots and lots of free stuff here where you can download. So when you go to um, retrievalpractice.org, you can see download our free practice guides. And so you can learn more about these. And look at this, how do, it's a 12 page article here on how to improve how to use retrieval practice, how to use spacing. There's various other ones here as well. Uh, even ones for early learning. This is, these are strategies that have been proven to work kindergarten, pre-kindergarten to post-secondary, uh, any subject, uh, struggling learners, advanced learners, average learners, um, most every content. And so uh, rest assured, this is a really great site to come back to. They are also on social media. Uh, if you're a Twitter or Facebook user, you can look up retrieval practice. They give a lot of good stuff. Um, there's also another group called the Learning Scientists. And there's a website I'll share with you as well, learningscientists.org. They have a whole bunch of awesome uh, free downloads. And let me just share that with you as well. So these are things that you can... Um, download for yourself or share with students or share with parents and so by going to space practice for example which we'll talk about as well what are these things how do you do them very easy to do they give some color posters powerpoint slides bookmarks stickers there's a youtube video about it there's all sorts of stuff that you can share it's nice visuals as well now these guys do have books as well um, which I'll come to later but if you just want the free stuff there is loads and loads of free stuff out there Okay, so first let's just figure out a little bit about these strategies themselves, okay? Uh, let me just 
uh, share with you a little bit of information. All right, so let's talk a little bit about what is retrieval practice? What are we talking about, okay? Um, we think a lot about uh, cramming, getting information into students, okay? Filling students' brains with stuff. And what retrieval practice is kind of the opposite. It's the act of trying to remember or try to recall something. Now, as teachers, we've done lots of activities like this, quizzes, worksheets, activities where we're trying to get kids to remember uh, testing. Um, that kind of thing to do that. And a lot of times those quizzes and, and testing, we frame that around assessment, right? Trying to find, we try to find out what the students know. So here's the real thing I want you to remember about retrievable practice. This, what we're talking about here is not assessment practices, okay? Um, we are talking about learning strategy, okay? So, in short, with retrieval practice, just the act of trying to recall something helps you learn it better. Um, the act of trying to remember actually helps you learn it at a deeper level. So whether you're assessing these quizzes or the, uh, these retrieval practice activities or not, um, it is helping students learn at a deeper level. And we're not just talking about learning facts, okay? M although multi uh, memorization has been given a bad rap, um, memory is a huge component of learning, um, being able to use that information when we need it. But well, this is applicable to concept-based learning, uh, learning of skills, so ideas, facts. It works for all of it, okay? So the... Uh, so the metaphor here is instead of trying to cram stuff in people's brains, it's trying to get students to pull it out of their brain. Okay, look at that visual on there. Um, yeah, Rob, I've had the same thing. Uh, the links don't seem to copy and paste. So what you'll need to do is if they are hyperlinked, just click on them. Yeah, as Christina said. So I don't know why. Uh, I wonder if that's in the settings I can change. I don't know that it is, but I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to look into that one too because I've had the same issue myself. So that is retrieval practice, okay, in a nutshell, trying to pull out, and there are loads and loads and loads of different ways we can do that, and loads of technologies that can help us do that too, and that's what we're gonna cover here. The other thing we're gonna look at is this, is spacing, okay, spacing out this retrieval practice, sometimes called spaced practice or spaced retrieval practice. Now the idea is this, the sooner if you, the, the idea of cramming, let's say, we, it's a text link and not, not a hyperlink. Okay, um, Rob, I will find a way of getting these links to you, okay? Uh, I, will, I will put my email address in here and you can fire me an email. I'll send you a whole bunch of links after this, okay? All right, so you don't have to worry. If anybody else wants that too, uh, please just drop me an email and I will inspire you those links afterward. And sorry about this, a little glitchy thing. So here's the idea. Um, we talked about retrieval practice, right? Trying to pull information out of your brain, trying to recall something, trying to remember something. So the idea is this, as you start to forget, when you then do that retrieval practice, the learning becomes even more powerful and more longer lasting, okay? So cramming uh, the night before an exam can be very effective for learning the next day. So if you're cramming the night before an exam, if you're a student for the next day, it's fairly effective, the research shows, but you're not gonna, it, the faster that information comes in, the faster it's gonna leave your brain. And so it's not necessarily long lasting. It's not going to that long-term memory part of your brain. It's staying more in that working memory, that short-term memory. And so trying to practice, you know, starting your lessons each day by saying, let's try to recall what we did yesterday, or let's try to recall, and every once in a while, then what did we do a week ago, or pulling up things from a month ago. And the longer that you can challenge yourself, the act of almost forgetting and then retrieving it again successfully now that now that learning and that understanding will be even more durable and even more long lasting okay we think about things like math facts that we have in our brain or other skills that we have like driving okay we when we started doing this we were we were 
focused 100% on and all of our cognitive energy was focused on, on all of it. And as we just started to do this over and over and over again, over time, spaced out over time, um, it just becomes, you know, uh, automated almost. And while, you know, it's, it's not necessarily the case that our students are going to have every bit of knowledge, just completely automated, we do want to make it longer lasting and durable so that when they come to those problem solving, creativity, uh, critical thinking situations, that they will be able to pull on that information and then use that information, okay, moving forward. So that in a nutshell is what retrieval practice and spacing is, okay, does that make sense? So let's talk about some strategies now that can work with those particular uh, ideas, okay? So one particular learning strategy, so what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna hit a few learning strategies, and the reason I'm not going to, after that, we're gonna look at some specific technologies, specific practices with things like Google Classroom, with Flipgrid, with some other tools, and I'll give you some templates that are here. Um, and uh, we will take a look at specific technologies because any one of these strategies might be applicable in several different technologies, okay? So we'll start to see it through that lens. All right, so uh, one strategy, one technique for retrieval practice is called a brain drain, sometimes called a brain dump. And there's loads of different ways of referring to this. So essentially, in a nutshell, it's having students just try to recall a free writing activity. And maybe it's free speaking activity. But let's imagine they're just writing down everything they can recall. And they're just searching their brain. They're searching, searching, searching. It may take five minutes, it may take, depending on the age level and what they're capable of, it may take 10 minutes. So it's a long drawn out process where they are just trying their best to recall every single thing. They're connecting it to their background knowledge, of uh, the things they've learned, which is really effective, okay? So here's an important part to tell you another really important part from cognitive science. That the power with all this is in the struggle. Okay, when you're racking your brain to try to recall something, that is extremely, extremely effective. The problem is students think that when they're doing that, they don't know things very well, but that is where the magic happens. That struggle to recall, that struggle when you're starting to forget what you learned yesterday or last week or last month, when you're struggling to remember it um, and bring it back over time, that is where the magic happens, okay? They, uh, they call that desirable difficulties in cognitive science, okay? The easier something feels, chances, when it goes in as learning, chances are the less effective it is as a learning strategy. For example, note taking, not super effective for long-term learning. Um, Rereading stuff, pages and pages of notes, not effective. Rereading a textbook, not super effective, okay? So what we're gonna look here is for some alternatives to that that focus on that pulling information out. Does that make sense? So uh, brain drain is one activity. So whether it's on a piece of paper, in a Google Doc, spoken to a parent or a friend, uh, said through video, however it is, just racking your brain on a free open-ended thing where you're just racking your brain trying to recall what do you remember, boys and girls in grade six science, about the Bernoulli effect that we learned last week in terms of how a plane lifts off the ground? Why does that happen? What do you remember from that? All the things we learned. And then just it's open and it's free, okay? Brain drain. That's a little bit hard to do, particularly at the younger grades. And, and possibly as students start to learn these strategies that you're intentionally doing with them, that brain drain might be a bit of a challenge one. So here's another alternative to that. Uh, two things or three things. So either pausing a lesson or at the beginning of a lesson, at the end of a lesson, what are two things you recall that we have learned about so far? Okay, so maybe it's your pausing partway through a lesson. Maybe you're doing a session through your Google Meet and you pause and say, okay, now stop and pause and just jot down on a piece of paper. What are two things that you recall? Again, this is not about assessment. You don't have to even see these yourself. The act of students just trying to recall and write these things down will help them learn it better. 
Okay, it'll make the learning deeper, it'll make comprehension better, and it'll make it longer lasting. Okay, so now you certainly can do checks and balances on students uh, to uh, have them try to share with you those things from time to time, for sure, but just the act of them trying to recall will help them learn. So that's another variation of the brain drain is sort of a two things. Uh, what are two things? And again, these are prompts that you can have parents. Uh, okay, you did a, um, Christine, you did an activity today learning about the parts of a plant um, with your, with Mr. Moss. And so what are two things you remember from that? Now, maybe the parent has a cheat sheet of some sort that gives a bit more information that they can verify, okay? Um, Retrieve taking, so uh, this is in contrast to note taking. All right, see you later, Jeff, good luck. Hope you see you back, this will be recorded, um, so not a problem, drop me an email. Anyways, uh, retrieve taking, so when we think about note taking not being super effective, uh, the reason why is number one, as students are listening or participating in a lesson and they're stopping to write notes, number one, their attention is split. You can't really pay attention to more than one thing at a time. You can switch tasks, but you can't really pay attention to more than one thing at a time. It's just not possible. Um, and so when you're splitting that attention, that is one of the reasons. And also, you're just, it's, it's, it's a fairly passive activity of trying to just jot down things. It's not the note taking itself or even the rereading of those notes is not super effective in terms of actually having that learning stay with you or, or become meaningful. Remember, it's that act of trying to recall it, trying to retrieve it, that is the power. So, retrieve taking. You're teaching a lesson, if it's live, um, pause at the 10 minute mark or the 15 minute mark and say, okay, just let's pause for a moment and take one minute or two minutes, three minutes, depending on their age, and just jot down in note form. Don't let them take notes before that. Have them focus on you. Stay out of the chat room in that Google Meet, everybody. Let's focus on me right now. Now we're gonna pause and let's see everything. Let's do some note taking from what you recall of these last 10 minutes, five minutes, 15 minutes, etc. cetera. Um, so that is retrieve taking. Another strategy is uh, little mini quizzes. Uh, quizzing is an extremely effective way where right now we've talked about just recalling something from nothing, okay? So quizzes are also a very effective way to do retrieval practice. And oftentimes with these quizzes, students will see if it's a multiple choice quiz, students will see different answer options. So they're not fully pulling it out of their brain, they're trying to recognize it from those choices in a quiz. Quizzing is really, really effective. And there are lots of different tools out there. We'll touch on a couple uh, that are very effective and very, very quick and easy to get kids doing that retrieval practice. So little mini quizzes uh, on distinct knowledge. And when we think about the spacing out part, remember we learned about spacing, spaced retrieval practice. Um, One way to think about those quizzes is this, spacing them out. How I used to teach when I was in elementary, I was an elementary teacher, upper elementary for about 12 years. And how I taught was why well, I would do unit one and then I would go on to unit two and I would leave unit one alone. And I would go on to unit three, unit four, et cetera, in science, that kind of thing. And then in June, it would be pain for us all because we would, we would do all our, all our review in June. And they, by that time, what we had learned in September, October was long, long gone. I don't know if you can relate to this at all. If you were a grade six teacher, any teacher who was doing final exams and that kind of thing. And so the idea with space practice is not that you are practicing more, it's that you're taking that same amount of practice and spacing it out. So when I am on unit one, great. When I go on to unit two, Maybe I'm learning unit two, but I'm also pulling a little bit, doing a little bit of quizzing, a little retrieval practice from unit one as well. And I'm on unit three now, and I'm doing some retrieval practice from unit two and unit one as well. And so we're mixing it together. You can see in that graphic there, as I try to remember, 
what I did not only 15 minutes ago, but maybe yesterday, maybe a week ago, maybe a month ago. The longer you can remember something, okay, the longer you will remember it into the future, okay? So if that's why, and obviously you can't just go cold turkey to one month ago, you're gonna have to build up to it, right? That's why you keep bringing it back. So these mini quizzes, which bring back not only the stuff you're doing currently, but the stuff you've done previously uh, can also be very, very effective. All right, let me just go on in my slides here. So mini quizzes are really, really effective. And I say mini quizzes because what the research is also saying is when you're doing these types of quizzing, uh, brain drains, all of this stuff, make them very low stakes. If they're going to be worth marks at all, don't make them worth many marks. Oftentimes you can do this with at make them no stakes. Don't make them worth any marks. You don't have to even look at what they've retrieved uh, on their retrieve taking notes. Uh, unless you believe they're not actually doing it, right? If you want to just kind of check in and see that they've actually done something, but in terms of grading is what I mean. So you might do a Google Classroom activity where you give students a little uh, Google Doc, one copy for each student where they're doing some of these notes. You just, every once in a while, you're going to check through that. Yep, they've actually got some notes. They're okay, good, good. Um, but you don't have to um, necessarily grade them. What this does, when you make these mini quizzes and these little activities low stakes or no stakes, guess what happens? When you make this just part of every day, every week learning, what happens is when, the, when it comes time for higher stakes uh, exams, final exams, uh, unit exams, things like that, what the research shows is that test anxiety comes way down. So if, if this is just part of everyday learning, then when it comes time for the real quiz, I'm not gonna get as nearly as super anxious and uh, uptight about this. So that is a really encouraging thing from a social emotional learning point of view that um, we, when it does come time for the uh, higher stakes stuff, um, that that test anxiety comes way down. Oh, that's a good question. I got a question from Christoph wondering, has that research changed in terms of how many times you have to forget or relearn uh, that kind of thing? That I'm not sure. I, I haven't seen that specifically uh, in the research uh, in terms of how many times we're, we're trying not to forget. And the, re the way we're trying not to forget is by trying, we're almost at the point where we're forgetting. And then that's what the spacing does, right? And then we try to retrieve it again. And, and and then maybe you're only remembering 50% of it or 60%. And then you look at your sources. Ah, that's it. That's it. Okay. Um, but yeah, definitely the more times you're doing this, uh, the, the, the more it is going into that long-term memory um, and becoming more, more permanent over a longer period of time. Okay. And that's why things like these basic facts are just because we've done this so many times over such a long period of time, it's just for most people, it's just second nature, you know writing a sentence, we're not thinking nearly as much. There's the odd word we're thinking about the spelling, but we're not, it's not taking up a lot of our mental processes to just get through those individual words, okay? Um, so I didn't really answer your question, Christoph. So the answer is I'm not entirely sure um, on that part of the research. Uh, so there's another cool thing that I'm gonna show you here. And that is a, uh, I'll come to a web, we'll look into this in greater detail, but there's been a wonderful educator named Kate Jones. She's written a book called Retrieval Practices. She's a UK um, writer, teacher, the history teacher. Uh, her, her website is called lovetoteach87.com and that's her Twitter handle as well. She's British. And um, she has created a different way to do that retrieval practice and spacing, and that's through these retrieval practice challenge grids. So it's just little prompts, and they're color coded based on when it was learned. So the, if you look at my screen here, the bright blue is the uh, what we learned yesterday, what we learned in our last lesson. The kind of salmon color is what was learned last week. Uh, green was two weeks ago and purple is even before that. So little prompts 
try to recall this, just challenges in it. So this is a way of doing, building in that spacing. This can be done on paper. This can be done on, um, so if students are not, do not have technology at home, the teacher can create this digitally on a Word doc or PowerPoint or Google, whatever, uh, save it, print it off, send it to students. They can have these little challenge grids at home. They have uh, the answers somewhere that they can, the source that they can refer back to, or the parent does if the parent's helping them. These are wonderful activities for parents. Like, what, what are my parents going to do to help here? How can I enlist my parents to help? These types of activities are wonderful to get parents into the game. Uh, and so uh, sometimes it's even done as a game. So this challenge grid, as you can see here, uh, there's, in this case, there's just a fun point value assigned to this particular one. And the further back in time this was learned, the higher the point value. So if you see over in the far right side of that uh, challenge grid, the things that were even more than two weeks ago are worth four points. So if I can explain the term bourgeoisie, which we learned more than two weeks ago, I get four points. Whereas if I remember uh, who was Anatoly Lunikarsky, I am not a high school social studies teacher. Does anybody know? I'm not even sure. This is British uh, curriculum, but um, it's looking like it's, it's, they're looking at uh, socialism and uh, Soviet Union. Anyways, that was learned last class. So that's only worth one point. Does that make sense? So suit yourself whether you want to attach a point value for it uh, for students. It can be a way of they can see, they go through this, see how many points they get. And what they'll see over time is as that point value rises, uh, they'll see themselves getting better at this, okay? Because here's an important thing to note. Students aren't necessarily going to love this. You know why? Because it's challenging. Remember that uh, desirable difficulties, right, is the term. It is a struggle. It's supposed to be a struggle. The struggle is where the magic happens in terms of that learning and deepening learning. So, letting kids in at an age-appropriate level that it's, this is, this is, if, it, if you're struggling with this and really racking your brain for this, uh, this is good. This is what learning should be. This is what we want it to be. If it feels really easy, it's probably, generally speaking, not super effective. Okay? Listening to someone talk, writing notes, rereading from a textbook feels easy. You get that illusion of fluency that, that is not really there. Okay? So that is uh, an important thing to remember. So uh, that is what retrieval practice challenge grids are. So those are a few strategies we've looked at so far, that brain drain, two things, retrieve taking, uh, mini quizzes, and retrieval practice challenge grids. Those are some specific teaching strategies, learning strategies, I should say, uh, that you can build into your lessons to help make that learning more durable over time through retrieval practice and spacing. Now let's take a look at some tools that can help this out, okay? Let's take a look at some very specific practices with these tools that can help out. Um, a lot of teachers in Alberta are using Google and Google Classroom. And so the first example I'll give is from Google Classroom. So in classroom.google.com, we're going to do a uh, an activity here. I really love in Google Classroom. I'm going to open up a Google Classroom and go into my classwork section. What I really want to impress upon you, I know a lot of teachers are using two main ways they create things. They're creating two main things. One of them is a material. That's a kind of a one-way push. It's a video. I'm sending you a file to read. I'm sending you a website to go to or an assignment where I want something back from you. But this one is one I highly encourage teachers to use, and it's great for retrieval practice. And it is a question type, okay? So when I open up this Google, is anybody using the Google Classroom question types? Anybody want to share in the, the group chat there? Um, anybody not familiar with? Oh, good, uh, Katie. Feel free to share if you wish to how you're using the question type as well. But basically what I want to share is, for those of you who have not used, anybody, for anybody in here, is, is the question piece a new thing? Are you not familiar with the question piece? 
if everybody has seen this question piece here, I won't belabor it. Okay, a couple of people are saying they're not super familiar with it. Not at all. Wonderful. Okay, I'll just go over it here. So uh, it'll uh, basically when you insert a question, there are two kinds of questions you can ask. And one is a short answer, and one is a multiple choice. You can see right now, I hope you're making connections with some of the things we've looked at. And so for let's think of that brain drain. Let's think of that two things activity where we're saying, what are two things? What are two things you remember? Don't you love watching someone uh, type and make spelling mistakes? Remember from our science class about the Bernoulli effect. So now students will just, in the short answer piece, they will just type what they recall. And then as a teacher, it shows up as, it's a, it's a type of assignment. So you can assign points to it. I would not. I would leave it ungraded personally. You can put it in your topic. Okay, this one's gonna be science. Now, two important things to note, uh, an option you have. One option is that you can make this private, that students cannot see each other's replies. So if you just wanna do that kind of exit ticket activity where it's like two things, you wanna just check to see what they remember, you don't want them to see each other's responses, then what you wanna do is you wanna uncheck this box here in the question, uncheck it. We don't want to see students seeing and replying to each other, okay? But if you want to leave that piece on, now what it becomes, now students are seeing not only, they're not only doing that retrieval practice of what they remember, but they're now seeing what all the other students remember too. And they're able to even reply to each other and have a discussion about it, okay? Now, I often tell teachers in your Google Classroom, turn off the ability for students to post and comment in the stream because it can get nutty. But this is a way that, you, in a controlled fashion, using the question type, that you can control that narrative, control that conversation, and give them opportunities to participate. So it's very easy to get going here. I put this question in. I don't have to attach any documents. I'm not, it's very simple, okay? So with the short answer, just what I want you to remember here is either leave this checked on so they can see each other's two things, and respond to them, or they can't with the unchecked box, okay? So think about what you wanna do with that. Um, the other option you have is a multiple choice where you can do it again. Uh, if you want to do it as sort of a check for understanding, then uncheck this part, students can see the class summary. And you're just gonna pose, pose a question and here are your answers. Just a multi single multiple choice question is all it is. You, again, you can keep it ungraded or you can make it worth very low marks or not really count in your grade book, even if it is worth marks. Um, and that is, uh, you can do a single multiple choice question right there. And uh, what is the purpose of this students can see the class summary? That is when you want to use this question tool as a polling or a survey tool. So how do you, which statement do you agree with most? Statement A, B, C, D. What is your favorite this? Or what do you think is the most important part of the story, A, B, C, or D? And then the students see each other's results in this live kind of a bar graph that goes along in Google Classroom. But if it's sort of that exit ticket where you just wanna see what students uh, know, you can uncheck that. And then you can see what each, how many students answered this or that. How much, what percentage of your students are, are accurate in this answering this question? It can give you a little bit of information uh, about reteaching, so that formative assessment on what you might need to then work on or reteach, or no, actually, I think the students kind of got that for the most part. 90% of the students got the question right. But, um, but more than anything, the retrieval practice is for them. Again, it's not, we're not talking about an assessment practice, we're talking about a learning strategy, okay? Uh, all right, how do you feel today? Oh, that's very good, that's a great one. Um, very pointed thing to give them. Uh, Kate, Katie, that's a great one. How do you do a multiple, can you show this after a multiple choice test? Uh, let's see. Surely, I'm trying to understand what you mean. So, um, are you wanting me to demonstrate something or are you wondering if from a practice standpoint, is this something you could do after a lesson, at the end of a lesson, or at the beginning of tomorrow's lesson, you could say, hey, 
what do you, this is a question about what we did yesterday or last week or something like that. Um, so maybe just if you wouldn't mind, Shirley, add a little more detail, I'll try to understand what you're referring to. So uh, the Google Classroom piece and that question choice is certainly one good option for that. Another good option is just a straight up Google Doc and just either whether you put a writing prompt in there for students uh, or whether you just pose it in the assignment, just having them do that either brain dump or do that two things, okay? So get kids going and get them familiar with using Google Docs. A really fast way for students to get started with a Google Doc or you is just typing docs.new, docs.new. How to create multiple choice questions. Okay, uh, so before we go on to that one, I'll just demonstrate how you create those multiple choice questions. I'm gonna go create a question. I'll change it to multiple choice. So um, what is eight times four? Option one, 30. Add an option, 32. Add an option, 34. Add an option, 36. So there is my question, and all I need to do now is just hit ask. Or I could postpone that and schedule it to show up on the Google Classroom whenever I want. So let's say hit ask. Here is how it's gonna show up for students, okay? Uh, what is eight times four? And they'll have an answer option. Uh, I'm in the teacher view here, so it won't really show what the students see, but they'll basically have that multiple choice. And then you as a teacher would see this grid right here. And you'll see how many students answered 30, 32, 34, 36. And let me just double check in that. Yeah, I wanna take this part off. I don't want students to see the results of how everybody else answered. So I'm just gonna go back and hit save. I should have remembered to do that. I, as a teacher, will see this. How many students answered this choice, this choice, this, this? This will be a number of students who answered that. There will be a bar graph here, but the students won't. Okay. If you want to assign a mark to it, great. If not, you don't have to. You can leave it ungraded. Does that make sense? All right. So uh, in a Google Doc, I can just hit docs.new and I can start free writing. Let's write everything we remember about Bernoulli's principle um, of lift. So I could start typing. Now some of our young people or some students just have difficulty typing. We can use tools like voice typing. And then just by hitting their microphone, I remember that the Bernoulli effect is where air moves really fast over the top of a wing and it moves a little bit slower underneath the wing. And because the air moves really fast over top of the wing, it causes less air pressure than on the bottom. And things always wanna to move to where there's less pressure. So that's why it causes the airplane to lift up in the air because that's where the less pressure is, period. There, the wing is curved on top, which causes the air to move a little bit faster and makes the air pressure a little bit lower, which is why it lifts up, period. So you can use that. Um, it's the voice typing is a way to get that text down very quickly. Uh, they can go back into it now and do a little bit of editing, but if they're struggling getting the, uh, struggling with getting some fluency of ideas because they type slowly, this is one way to kind of mitigate that. So now the students can go in and call it whatever they want and then they can attach it back to you in an assignment. Even better, what I can do as a teacher is I can go create assignment if I'm in Google Classroom. Brain drain Bernoulli. I'm just gonna say Bernoulli, okay? So what I can do as a teacher in Google Classroom is I can provide that little template for students using this create button. What do I want them to give me back? Is it a Google Doc? Is it a slide? I'm gonna hit Docs. It'll create one on the fly and it will attach it to this assignment. I can either leave it blank or I can pose the writing prompt that I want them to write to, whether it's two things or a brain drain or whatever it is I want them to write, I can just give my writing prompt here for them to do some of that retrieval practice. And then back in Google Classroom, remember, I want to make a copy for each student. 
And now each student has that. I hit assign. Okay. By the way, if you're it's a Friday here, you're working ahead for next week. Don't just hit assign because they're going to see it right away. Hit the drop down arrow next to assign and choose schedule. And then schedule that to show up on your Google Classroom. I don't want it to show up till next Tuesday at 11 o'clock. Schedule. So I will see it. Check out how I will see it as a teacher. I'll see it great out there. They won't see it at all uh, until next Tuesday at one o'clock. And then, and boom, it'll show up there and be ready for them. Okay, so let's go into uh, Google Slides. Now, why don't I give you um, Google Slides are extremely powerful tools. And I did a session, uh, repeated it twice actually, or repeated it once, I suppose, did it twice on using Google Slides as sort of that digital learning canvas. So when I create a Google Slide, there's a lot of stuff that I can add in here. I can add in text, I can add in pictures, I can add in video, uh, I can add in so much stuff. Watch a really nice shortcut. If we want students to be doing some writing on paper, uh, no, you don't have to install any software. It's built into the web browser. All you need is a microphone, uh, Jad. Uh, so if they've got a laptop or a Chromebook, um, they have a microphone. Uh, it's actually right by the webcam. If, if you look, you might see a little pinhole to the left or right, in some cases both. That's the microphone. So it will be there. And you don't have to, it just, just does it right through the web browser. Now the first time they do that voice typing, Chrome browser will say, hey, can we use your microphone? You don't have to say, oh wow. Um, all right, so uh, what I really like about Google Slides is the ability to add so much different content. And here's a handy way of digitizing something that's in paper. Inserting an image gives you an option. I'm going to just turn off my video camera so this is going to work. Insert an image from their camera. Okay, now if they've got a laptop or a Chromebook, now it opens up the camera. They hold up whatever they had on paper and they take a picture of it. So they can either hit this camera button here. You should try this out. This is really easy. Try it, hit the camera button. Now, if you have young kids or kids are struggling, they're holding this up, they can't find that camera shutter button, just push the space bar and that will also take that picture. I hit insert and now I've got it on here. So if I've written something down, let's say I've written down three, two important things, I can digitize it or if I could, you know, draw a diagram of something or a map or anything uh, from what we learned yesterday, that retrieval, have them digitize it through the, uh, the camera. This works in Google Docs, it works in Google Slides. Now, for those of you who are uh, starting to use the tool Screencastify, for students using Screencastify, there is a way for them to record their screen Okay, so let's say they'll record their webcam only, and maybe you want to have them talk about what they remember. So I can use my webcam, just give it a second here. It's just because I've got so many processes open, it's just taking a moment. There we go. Uh, here's what I remember about the Bernoulli effect. And then I just, when I'm done, I hit stop. And basically, what's going to happen with Screencastify is when it is ready, it's going to pop open a new tab and it is automatically uploading that video to my Google Drive. Here it comes. I didn't even do anything. It just does this all by itself. So it is uploading this video right here. You can see it. it's uploading to Google Drive right now. So the moment it does, the moment it does, I can just turn on the link sharing so that other people could view that video. Okay, there's a button right there. Now people can view that video. I'm going into my Google Slides and I can just go insert video. And um, where is it? It's not in YouTube, it's in Google Drive. And what you'll see is here it is. Okay, now it'll take a couple minutes to process that video, but what you'll see already is it's ready to go. So now when students do that, now we can see them explaining things, okay? Uh, their own understanding. So it's a different way of doing that kind of brain drain. You can resize that and so on. Um, 
speaking of Google Slides, I want to give you that, I want to give you a link to a Google Drive, shared Google Drive. This is based on that Kate Jones, uh, based on that Kate Jones person's retrieval practice challenge grid. Let me just copy that. For those of you who'd like to make digital copies of this retrieval practice challenge grid and send them out to your students, just hit that link there. Now, basically what you'll see is when I open this up, now it's got it in PowerPoint, it's got it in Google Slides. Um, there's lots of different options for, um, for this. It's even in PDF and you could do this in Microsoft Word. And basically now you've got a uh, three column grid, a four column grid, a five column grid. Anytime you see a Google Slides or a Google Doc that you like, just go file, make a copy. Now you have your own copy. You can choose those things that you did yesterday, last week, two weeks ago, and beyond two weeks ago, and then have students try to create these. You can create these challenge grids and then uh, send them home to parents, whether it's in paper form or whether it's digitally. So this is a handy thing. Kate didn't make this, but there was another, I don't remember the gentleman's name. There was someone who built on that um, retrieval practice challenge grids. This guy named ICT Evangelist. Uh, he was the guy who made this. Here's the website where the, he gave those uh, templates. He gave a link to that Google Drive that I've shared with you, okay? So I'll give you the link to his blog post to give him credit, as well as if you want to read a little bit more about that. But uh, Kate Jones has them right here. She's got loads of examples on this page as well. Now there are other tools as well. Some of you may have been using Flipgrid or have heard of Flipgrid. This is where a teacher can very easily, it's free for teachers, it's owned by Microsoft. And uh, very easily, teachers can log in and create these discussion prompts. So imagine asking students to try to recall what they learned about a particular topic. And then the students can go into this. Uh, and then after they sign in with their Google or Microsoft, the student now can just pop open this camera here. Let me just turn off my camera. can just pop this open and do a quick recording and now they can explain in great detail everything they remember about that uh, particular topic. So there's another tool to do that retrieval practice. Um, and, and it's very easy for teachers to get started with that. I've been doing a couple of uh, Flipgrid sessions and uh, I'll do, I'm going to probably do another one next week if there's enough interest for people, okay? So in a nutshell, that is what we, let me go back to my other slides. Um, those are some retrieval practice strategies. Um, again, retrievalpractice.org. Uh, Maria, you want to learn about the voice, the text to voice thing. Sure, stick around after this session and I'll show you if you want. Um, so that is it. So there's retrieval practice and spacing to really help make that learning durable. You've seen some strategies for um, doing that and we've looked at some specific technologies to help that as well. This recording will be on my Google Doc uh, on this one AT, ATA PD live sessions. So Christine had shared the link to that earlier and uh, the um, recording links are going to be in there as well. And so you'll be able to come back to this a little bit later today. I'll probably have this up by noon, the recording for this link, if you would like it. So I'm going to hit stop on the recording.